little bit more about the life of Hugh Carey among some other topics is veteran Albany politician Jack McEnany. Assemblyman, it is good to see you. Well, it's nice to be here. Um, this funeral it, this morning was very moving and very yes. personal. But also what sort of amazed me was how his spirit of affability and humor came out. Was that your memory of him? Too? Yes. Yeah, I, I think it was of anybody who was ever close to him. <laughs> uh, he's a very warm, personal uh, uh, individual, great sense of humor, a good storyteller, a good listener, and somebody who uh, really cared very much for his family. I think all of that is evident to people. Yeah, it, because some of the writing about him, and when you when you see pictures of him, he looked yeah. like he could be quite dour, actually. Yeah. So I was surprised, and there was a lot of talk about him, you know, singing. And were you at his inauguration? Yes. You were. Yeah. There was also a recollection, uh, someone's recollection of his kids all coming up to the to an Irish tune in the in the assembly yeah. chamber. Do you remember uh, that? I remember them all up there. I forget about the Irish, <laughs> the Irish tune. I remember the days of wine and roses. Oh well, yeah, who could forget that? In the that? state of the state. Sure. Yeah. What um, was your experience with him? Well, I, he would go in and out of our lives in Albany in many different ways. Uh, more recently, he would show up. Uh, consistently during the Pataki years for the State of the State address yep. in the Assembly Chamber and it was a real thrill. I went to Northern Ireland with him with President Clinton's uh, mission back in the in the mid 90s and when I worked for the city under Mayor Corning I was appointed by him uh, to a couple of positions. Uh, one was the uh, uh, Committee to Save Union Station. Mm. So you know we he was very much a part of Albany. He actually lived in the mansion. His children went to the uh, local schools. So uh, people were conscious of, of Hugh Carey being a part of the Albany and Capital District community as well as being governor that of the state. That is, well, Bishop Howard Hubbard was also there this morning. Yep. I, uh, that is something that's a little bit lost, right? And it has yep. been since Mario Cuomo because you haven't had a family in the mansion that's right. since Mario. It really must make a huge difference just in the fabric of the community of Albany. It does. It's part of the uh, the prestige, part of the interesting part of being about a, of being a, uh, um, a state capital. Yeah. Uh, Albany is one of those cities that has two dimensions. One is very small, Benny, very uh, very close and intimate, and then another one that you're always on the world stage. Whoever goes into Eagle Street is potentially the next president or vice president of the United States. And right. There's a whole parallel of uh, institutions, whether it's Albany Medical Center or the university that are known, the Writers Institute, are known nation and even worldwide. And then at the same time, neighborhoods are one of the most important elements. And uh, a successful governor from an Albany point of view uh, walks uh, in both those worlds. It, another interesting thing that I noted uh, was the um, closeness of the, and I think this probably ended with Kerry's yeah. administration, between the governor's office and the church. Uh, yes, that's true, although when he first came into office, he was, uh, he supported the uh, pro-choice, which was on the books at the time, so right. he certainly didn't walk in lockstep all the time with the church, but there was never a time that you ever felt that Hugh Carey was not an Irish Catholic and very much a part of that community and very proud of, of that identity. He did get in trouble with his own base at one time because the so-called four, four horsemen of Tip O'Neill and of, uh, uh, of, of uh, Ted Kennedy and uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan and he uh, really came out strongly against the IRA and Carey undiplomatically referred to them, quote, as a bunch of thugs for which he was thrown out of the ancient order of Hibernians in Brooklyn that he had belonged to probably for his entire adult life. Yeah, well, he was a pretty outspoken yeah. guy, it sounds like well, to me. Well, he, he would speak out against his uh, Democratic Party colleagues or uh, against his Irish Catholic background or against uh, the church when he felt that that was his obligation. He was a pre he was independent, certainly. I, I also want to talk uh, a little bit, and then we have to switch gears for this, although yeah. I guess we could say we're staying in New York City for the moment. You, you are sort of our go-to guy about uh, the census yeah. and all things redistricting. You're serving on lap four. The mayor of New York City formally challenged the census numbers. Uh, basically alleging an undercount in Queens and Brooklyn. Yeah. Not a surprise because he did question the numbers and you must have too. I think actually you did. I, when you I think everybody it. was uh, was appalled that Queens, which has known a fair amount of prosperity and we assume growth, had 12 or 1300 people added in 10 years. 
it just didn't make sense. Now, New York State, contrary to reports that you did not lose population, we gained over 400,000 people mm. in those 10 years. But to think of uh, it primarily downstate and especially Long Island growth, but to think of Queens only getting 12 or 1,300 people just seemed ludicrous. And when you go over into areas of Brooklyn that ex had experienced enormous uh, gentrification, revitalization, new construction, uh, likewise the numbers were shockingly low. Uh, so much on the positive because I certainly endorse uh, the city's opinion that they got an undercount. But going to the negative, I can't ever think of a successful lawsuit against the census that oh. would bring about uh, a true recount. So uh, it's really an uphill lawsuit, and I, w I obviously wish the city uh, all the success in so, the world. So what does that mean? Not you, A full recount would mean that you go back out and re-canvas everyone. Can you get a or new estimation? Well, I would think it would be a selective, but the way the law and the Constitution is written now, you get that one snapshot Mm -hmm. on April 1st of 2010 and you're out of luck if you disagree with it mm -hmm. and I've seen a great many elected officials over the years I remember myself doing this in the in the Corning years saying that this simply is untrue and I've never seen a successful recount. The problem, particularly in Queens, is that there are so many immigrants there, and there are people who probably are not thrilled about going to the door with a stranger with a clipboard, and they might their status might be questionable. Th that's a part of it, and there's no question that that's a part of it, but there's also a serious question about housing, hmm. and the people in New York are of the opinion that housing under construction was actually occupied uh, on a April the 1st and that the people in that housing should have been counted, that they weren't just construction sites. And the other part of the equation is an enormous number of vacant housing that the city, frankly, doesn't agree with, or under construction vacant housing. They believe a lot of it was occupied by people who simply weren't counted. So what does this mean for the redistricting process? What if, for, by some amazing yep. situation, the history does not repeat itself and they're successful in some way here? Then you guys, having already begun... We, we would have to get official numbers from the census telling us that this count is off and we would have to have them geocoded to the exact city block uh, that they were put back in. So we would just do what we had to do. Okay, would it require a significant, would it cause a significant setback in your opinion? Well, it would be a delay, but you know, it's the type of thing you put whatever resources you need to. See, we're under the gun with the early primary requirement. It's interesting that you bring yeah. that up. So we, we believe that the legislature and, and official state yeah. officials are indeed going to change the primary, moving it not from September to August, which was originally discussed, but from September to yes. June. Well, you'd never, well, People my age remember when June was primary season. Right. And that's something I don't. we wiped out. That's <laughs> I'm sorry. Very good. <laughs> Reestablishing your youth and vitality. Yes. Now that lasted till about 1972 or 73. And then we moved it because people didn't like the distance between the primary and the general elections. A lot of things can happen in six months. Sure. We moved it up to September, which makes a lot of sense. But the problem is, and, and Senator Schumer has been a champion of this, that 20 percent of all servicemen and women don't have their absentee ballot counted. Right. And it's the Justice Department that's saying you've got to move it. You don't move it to August. The schools are closed. People are on vacation. Likewise, July, which means welcome back to the early 1970s to June. Okay, but Assemblyman, you're in session in June. Oh, I'm not advocating this. I'm just saying that's the way it looks like it's going to be. So will people actually, will the absenteeism go through the roof in June in the legislature? No, I don't think so. I think if you're running for office, you're going to have a hard time here or in Washington uh, doing your job. And also, realistically, a lot of difficult issues which are solved to one extent or another by the end of June uh, by early June will still be up in the air, still controversial. Yeah. And uh, gay marriage, it, for example, went to the very last exactly, minute here. Exactly. So it, politically, it would be difficult. Right now, what LAT4, which is the the code for our redistricting commission, what right. we're looking at is just trying to meet the deadline. And if you put 45 minutes in, or 45 days for mailing, 
and then three or four days to print, and then you're putting in several days to accept or decline petitions, and five or six weeks of petitioning, what are you talking about? You're talking about figure out what the lines are by the first part of February, and uh, of course if the governor vetoes, that's another wild card in there. Right. Then notify the uh, the respective counties. Will notify for the appropriate conventions. Then you hold the convention. Then you do the petitioning. Uh, it's it's going to be very difficult under any scenario. Okay. Well, obviously an ongoing story. Unfortunately, yeah. we are out of time. I want to thank you for making time for us tonight. It is great to see you, Assemblyman. It's great. Nice Thanks. to be here.